Radio 4. It's five past three. Afternoon theatre. The Instruments of Darkness by Michael Robson. With Nigel Stock as Inspector Millions, Anthony Hall as Dynasty Shawcard, Elizabeth Proud as Melisson Lady Quandre, and Richard Handel as Porrit. The Instruments of Darkness. Milord! 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 Ah, what is it, Parrot? Uh, breakfast is quite ready, Milord. Why, thank you, Parrot. Oh, what was that, Milord? Another subsidence, I fear. It seems that our garden by the sea is diminishing rapidly. How long, I wonder, before the very foundations of the house be threatened. I think the garden will outlive us all, my lord. I pray you are right, for Dunwich has yielded much more than enough to the sea already. They say that when the tides are northerly, you can hear the bells of the sunken churches tolling for the dead and for those yet to die. Oh, I have heard that superstition, my lord, and prefer to disregard it. I admire your sturdy common sense. I wish I could share it. Good morning, Xerxes. Mm. Ah, my dear girl. Had I known you were coming down for breakfast, I should have waited. I am glad you did not, for I shall be eating nothing. A drink of tea will serve me well enough. <laughs> Are you uh, perfectly yourself, Melisande? You appear fragile. Lovely, but fragile. Why those violet stains beneath your eyes? I slept indifferently. The sea thundering against the cliffs awoke me. Thereafter I was troubled with unpleasant dreams. How very discommoding. Yes. Well, the sun is shining now and my spirits have somewhat risen. Does the Times have any... Interesting items of information this morning. Yeah, do you know it does? I had scarcely begun reading of bizarre events at the Crystal Palace when you came into the room. Bizarre events? How so? Let me read you the report. <clears throat> the happy excitement attendant upon the forthcoming opening of the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park by Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness Prince Albert has been marred by two inexplicable fatalities. Oh. Two days ago, at half past six o'clock in the morning, a scaffolder, one Victory Tid, was seen abruptly to collapse and fall heavily and headlong some 40 feet through glass and past girders to the floor of the Oriental Tea Room. Oh, the poor creature. <clears throat> but yesterday morning, an even more macabre death was to follow. During an informal visit by several members of Parliament, a man was seen lying motionless some 60 feet up in the branches of a sycamore tree, the centerpiece of an horticultural display. When the unfortunate person was eventually reached, it was found that his heart was savagely ruptured. <gasps> Though by what agency it has not yet been determined. The deceased... Who had... Great heavens! Xerxes, what is it? The deceased, who had become one of the most gifted landscape gardeners of the exhibition, has been named as Mr. Temperance Muldoon of Chelsea. Muldoon? Ah! Oh. Oh. Sure card! Sure card! Where is the lad? Confound him. Come in, sir. At once, sir. On my way, sir. Well, sir, may I give you good morning, sir? No, you may not, sir. Do you know where I have been this past hour, sure card? I have been closeted with the man upstairs. That man has seen fit to postpone my proposed holiday to Hove in favour of a new investigation. Are there not, I cried, other officers of the detective force who are capable of undertaking this work? 
But that man was adamant, lad, was obdurate as very agate. Millions must lead this investigation, he said, and millions must solve it within the fortnight before the royal couple open the exhibition at the Crystal Palace. I'm glad to make your acquaintance, Inspector Millions, though I could wish the circumstances had been more congenial. Indeed, Sir Joseph. Two dreadful shadows over the forthcoming exhibition. Uh, uh, this is my assistant, uh, Mr. Dynasty Shurkard. Uh, Shurkard, be gratified to meet Sir Joseph Paxton, prime planner of this remarkable edifice. Gratified to be sure, Sir Joseph. And may I add my sincere congratulations on this vast, though graceful spectacle. Shurkard! We have detected business to hand, and these felicitations must wait upon a more suitable occasion. I am sure Sir Joseph will concur. Uh, I will. Uh, tell me, uh, tell me how I may assist you, gentlemen, and assist you I will and shall. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, were the men Victory Tid and Temperance Muldoon known personally to you? Tid, I hardly knew at all, but I secured the services of Muldoon myself. He was a very considerable gardener. Tragic loss. Tragic loss. When did Muldoon enter upon his labours here? Eight months ago, almost to the day. He came to me with strong recommendations from his former employer, Xerxes, Lord Quandary of Paradox Park in the county of Suffolk. Ah, thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, both these men gave every satisfaction. In all respects. No hostile elements within the exhibition, sir? No internal jealousies or petty vindications? Uh, none, to my knowledge. Uh, nay, I may add that until these tragedies occurred, the very air of Hyde Park was supremely joyous. Uh, joyous, perhaps. Uh, joyous, uh, superficially. Yet homicide, sir, is my forte. And I think and believe my superiors would not have seen fit to cancel my proposed visit to home for anything less instinct with horror than the homicide. To that end, Sir Joseph, our next call is upon Dr. Melchior Yolland, who examined the bodies of both Tid and Muldoon. But what more can you wish to know, Inspector? Your <laughs> senior has copies of my report already. Your reports do not make it clear, Dr. Yolland, if both Tid and Muldoon were hailed before the judgment seat by similar means. And because the situations were quite different. Tid fell through glass, glanced off girders, and suffered further injuries from shattering a sandalwood case containing 144 pounds of prime Darjeeling. Oh. Muldoon, on the other hand, was found dead in the fork of a sycamore 60 feet above the ground. His injuries were the more readily able to be studied. Do you wish for the report, Inspector? Uh, thank you, lad. Uh, his diaphragm and lower ventricle had been shattered by what could have been, and I quote your words, Doctor, a missile projected with enormous force by some means quite unknown to this physician, mm. since the missile, if such it was, could not be found among the organs of the deceased, nor, as I understand it, in or anywhere near the tree in which the death took place. That is correct, sir. Those were my conclusions. Then what of victory did? Aside of those injuries he sustained while falling, was there also evidence of any such wound as put paid to the unfortunate Muldoon? I have already told you, viva voce, and I have clearly written down that the injuries sustained by Tid in falling were so many, so serious and so various, as to make it medically impossible to judge if the damage to the rib cage and heart had occurred before he began the fall, or no, I will not be moved from this opinion. Then may I persuade you to abandon your Hippocratic stance for a moment? and answer me as one citizen to another? What possible weapon might have killed Muldoon, or Muldoon and did, without leaving any remnant behind? Dr Melchior Yolland was not the most amiable surgeon, sir. I seem to detect, if you'll forgive the figure, a naked reluctance to further our inquiries. I should like to thrash him, sure, God. Thrash him within an inch of his insolent life. That a lisping pedant like Yolland should by so much as half an hour delay my trip to Hove moves me to thoughts of assassination. My blood rages. 
Your facial parts are indeed suffused, sir. Much more than is their wont. But sure, Card, despite Yolland's criminal vacillation, I am of opinion that Tid and Muldoon were killed by the same initial means and by the same hand. Find what connects the two men and we begin to trace a motive for their unseasonable parting from this world. Ah, that's the hammer that drives the nail. Something linked them, something much more desperate linked them than their adoration of horticulture at the Crystal Palace. And something that led them to seem of sufficient danger to a third party that he was obliged to remove them post haste. <laughs> and to this end, sure card, do you direct your step to Victory Tid's place of residence in Clerkenwell? Be unswerving in your investigations, lad. Admit of no makeshift evasions. For my part, I shall visit <coughs> Mrs. Caroline Muldoon at Poor Trincomalee Stairs in the borough of Chelsea. Woo! <laughs> My own heart bleeds for your condition, ma'am. It bleeds. It does, indeed. But uh, certain facts must be established if we are to lay his murderer by the heels. Oh, yes, sir, of course. I should do my best to stem these weak and foolish tears. <sighs> Ask on, sir, I pray. Victory, Tid. I'm very glad to hear it, sir, I'm sure. You must take me, ma'am. Victory, Tid also engaged upon work at the Crystal Palace, died not two days earlier in circumstances similar to those in which your husband brutally perished. Oh. Had you ever met Mr. Tid, ma'am? Never, sir, I swear. The name's all unknown to me. Your husband never mentioned him? Never, not once, I swear. No written communications ever passed between them? Letters, sir, do you mean? Oh, no, sir. Muldoon and me was obliterate, sir. You might say from birth. I'm proud of it. We read the Book of Nature, sir. That was all the learning we cared for. Your reverence for matters bucolic does you credit, ma'am. But as to that, what made your husband leave the employ of Lord Quandary in Suffolk, given his evident passion for those fecund acres, and seek his fortune here in the filth and venom of the city? I recall the moment precise and clear as an holy image, sir. I was in our little garden in Paradox Park one Sunday morning, a picking of rhubarb, sir, for dinner. An excellent clarifier of the blood, Inspector, and one I recommend. But you... what happened amongst the rhubarb, ma'am? Oh, Muldoon comes up to me and, Caroline, my girl, he cries, it's time to go, time to be off and away. You're leaving Lord Quandry, I count as after so many green and comforting years... Leaving, says he, and with ten golden guineas as a farewell present from his lordship. There, girl, what of that? <laughs> Your husband also bore letters of recommendation from Lord Quandary, I understand, with one of which he was able to secure employment at the Crystal Palace. Such, sir, was the case. Oh, 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 Inspector, what is that dreadful noise? You have a caller, ma'am, I fancy. Shall you answer it, Mrs Muldoon? Or will the caller wear out his knuckles on your door? <gasps> the door. Tis opening, Inspector. Are we to be slain in our beds? Our sins still out upon us? In our beds, ma'am. Shall I return later, sir? Sure, card. Why are you here and not in Clerkenwell, where your duty calls you? Uh, no cash, sir, in brief. No cash? Pockets empty, purse idle, exchequer a yawning void. Yawning voids in the course of an investigation? Is this the way to enhance your prospects of promotion, sure, card? Uh, interrupting, uh, as I did, a, a matter of uh, some intimacy. Uh, it, well, what the devil are you about talking about, lad? Was talk, what sir. carnal follies does your mind conjure? Uh, talk, sir, of beds and sins as I enter the parlour. Oh, again. your place, sure, card. Entertain no more presumptions of that. Ilk. Mrs Muldoon, was your husband called to higher service, leaving you in comfortable or indigent circumstances? Oh, 
Muldoon was ever thoughtful, gents. This property's mine. I shall again be letting the upper rooms, and rental fees shall take care of my anguished widowhood. Upper rooms? Did Mr Muldoon let them out then, prior to his death? Oh, yes, sir. Very discreet he was. Let to the quality, he said, engaged upon affairs of state. Affairs, affairs of, of state, state ma'am? Ma Shall I answer yourself, Inspector, or your young acquaintance, Mr Deadshore? Merely reply, Mrs Muldoon. Well, sir, about six months after we come to London, Muldoon tells me he has been approached by a person or persons of rank, station and breeding as to the use of certain rooms of quality and stintinction. Evidently, four trinkamily stairs suited these persons, and Muldoon was in receipt of a small but useful honorarium as a result. And did you discover who the person or persons of rank, station and breeding might be? Mr Surefire, I did not. I saw nothing of them being out the house a good deal during the day. Ah, uh, but what of the night, ma'am? The person or persons never stayed the night, sir. The person or person seldom used the rooms at all. Then do you think we might see these rooms, ma'am? An investigation there could prove highly pertinent. So, this is where affairs of state were conducted. <laughs> Sniff your card. Sniff again. Well, does nothing assail your nostrils? Some trace, uh, some lingering fragrance. Perfume, lad. Feminine perfume of the subtler sort. Do you believe this to be in a place of assignation, sir? I believe nothing. Yet. But perfume is certainly present. <sighs> Hello. What is it, sir? Cast your eye across the street. Who do you observe skulking down there? Fleet Ned Sprott. Fleet Ned, the my side informer. Have him sure card. I shall follow in my own time. But have it, lad, the truth from those rancid lips of his. Fleet Ned! Oh, my eye. Oh, my afflicted eye, the penis. Fleet Ned Sprott! A word with you, my dear! I'm a too old. Too old to let the couples like this. As once I did in the sweet days of yore. My lungs is fair for out. A word at you, Nick! Can't stop seeing me barber! Wait! I'm warned! Barber's my uncle! I was my squirrel! I warned you, Nick! <laughs> Fleet Ned Sprock in the gutter again. Can it be you, Mr. Million? I see a Sprott. I don't breathe near my face. You was always a sensitive man, Inspector. Fleet Ned, talk. Avert your face, but talk. Of long afternoons in the upper rooms of four drinkable east stairs. Don't know it, sir. Never been near the place. Please, there, don't waste my time. Time that could be far better spent in Hove, uh, contemplating the raging billows of the main, than here in the gutter with you. Adjust your memory, Ned. Don't cross him now. He's working to a fashion. Four trinkable he stares. A bow to the late Mr. Temperance Baldoon and his relict Caroline. Who visited when said Mrs. M was about her artless business away from home? Hey. He hesitates, sure, God. He gingerly proffers his hand. Now, what might Fleet Ned require? The power of cash to stir the memory is wonderful to behold, gents. Beauteous to see. Tuppence farthing, if we hear the truth. A week in Toki, if you temporise. Well, sirs. I've seen strange comings and goings at that abode of which you spoke but recent. Strange? A visitor. A visitor come there perhaps four times. Always of an afternoon. Always with a key. A visitor? What kind of visitor? High or low? Whig or Tory? Home or colonial? Poor or rich? Male or female? Of gender? The face, sirs, was always wild. 
The physique slight and trim, the clothing obscure but costly, mode of awry walk, cab. My guess, a young woman of uneasy virtue and considerable means, keeping of a assignation, or tryst. <laughs> you uh, spoke to the cabbies, doubtless. Uh -huh. Now, where would this young woman have hailed their services? Regent Street, sir. Always Regent Street. But why were you favouring that particular house with your attention, Fleet Nate? Because Muldoon spent freely in the four ales, gentlemen. And I wondered whence a humble gardener come with such ready, such often cash. Yeah. My ribs ache, sure, God. They torment me cruel. They inform me with a certainty, born of twenty years with a detective, that we are moving inexorably towards a perfect maelstrom of guilt and darkness. More devilry will surely follow these two murders. <laughs> Joint schism. Mm. Mr. Edgar Joint Schism. I am that man. And you, sir? At Nimble's Earthrow, sir. And my partner, Danvers Gimlinge. Earthrow, Gimlinge. French your thirsty nail, but listen. Only listen to what I have to propose. We flinch from nothing, sir, save infanticide and basket weaving. Trust us for all else. <laughs> I like you boys. I like a forthright manner. <laughs> Good. The matter, lads, is robbery. But robbery it must be by total stealth. Stealth boys must be the game. Leave us alone for stealth, sir. Only tell us the place, only the place, and what we are to remove. Close. Come close. Very close, boys. Xerxes, Lord Condry, and his lady wife are recently arrived once again in London to their townhouse in the borough of Marylebone. The house, good fellows both, is situate in Bentinck Street. A rare neighbourhood, sir, and full of promise for lads of metal. The house is in Bentinck Street, and formerly the dwelling of one Edward Gibbon. Gibbon the Welbeck Strangler, sir. Edward Gibbon, who sang the varied fortunes of the Roman Empire in many an improving volume. We are to remove a library, sir? Merely cease your interruptions and you shall learn what it is you are being paid to steal. But you are still pale, Melisande. Was I right to bring you to London? I was troubled by a recurrence of that dream that has disturbed so many of my slumbers at Paradox Park. But last night it was so real that I thought it must actually have happened here in Bentinck Street. So real? I thought I heard a long, hoarse scream of fear, a great clattering, then a dreadful, a most harrowing noise, as if someone had struck ground after falling from a desperate height. My treasure, you are still dwelling upon the spectacular and tragic deaths of poor Muldoon and the man Tid. Oh. But if you are to know any tranquility whatsoever, you must put these thoughts behind you. Uh, forgive me, my lord, mm. but there is a person from the detective wishing to see you. The oh. name of uh, Inspector Millions. From the detective, Porritt? What can he possibly want of Lord Quandary? I shall see him at once, Porritt. Very good, my lord. Should you repair to your room, Merisand, and recruit your strength in quiet? No, no, of course not. It behoves us to meet such a celebrity with the liveliest interest. Inspector Millions, my lord. Thank you, Porritt. That will be all. Your ladyship. Inspector. Lord Quandary. Most grateful for this signal opportunity. My dear Inspector, whatever we can do, we shall do. To aid you in your inquiries relevant to Temperance Muldoon. How swiftly, sir, you bring your lofty intellect to play upon the matter in hand. Ah. But why, given his wholesome devotion to all things rural, did Muldoon choose to quit his toils amid your Dunwich sanctuary and make for London? How often have I asked myself that selfsame question, sir? And what was your reply, my lord? I was at a loss for an answer. Ah. So no reason offers itself. He just ups and leaves. A forceful and a cogent description of his exit from my employment. Thank you. Now, um, his wife. Uh, was she a, a prime mobile in the Muldoon's urban adventure? Caroline, that most genuine, that warmest-hearted of natures. Rhubarb. 
was her one excess. Mm. She was else the completest of helpmates. The rhubarb, I well recall. You parted then from the Muldoons on the best of terms. Uh, ten guineas for the gardener and letters of recommendation. Accurate in each particular, sir. You can think then of no person or persons who might have harboured such resentment against Muldoon as to have accomplished his assassination? None, sir. The world was his friend. The mirror sang to his tread and all creation flowered beneath his sunshine blandishments. Then that shall be the superscription to his eternal resting place. Do you, my Xerxes, arrange it this very day? Yes. Um, come, sir. Haste, post, haste from Clerkenwell, from the innocent alleys of victory tin. Innocent? A dangerous word to use in my presence, sure, Carl. In the course of two long days and nights, I've discovered the late Victory Tid to have been a man of such startling virtue that I, I confess myself amazed he was not summoned to his eternal reward at birth. That poor fellow, sir, had not an enemy in the land. No eye recalling him but fills with tears. I feared as much. Tid blameless, Muldoon apparently so. Aside of that mysterious visitor in Chelsea. So, where now, sure, Carl? Where direct our path? From this fight, sir. At the moment when Muldoon was first glimpsed, dead in the branches of the sycamore tree at the horticultural exhibition area, no fewer than five members of Parliament was present, in addition to the official guide... Continue, lad. The political gents in question was Mr Cosmo Evergreen, Mr Hatchard Millicent, Sir Jericho Arbogast, Mr Nathaniel Upjohn, and the Laird of Yell. <laughs> Uh, pretty enough crew, and we shall talk to them, everyone. Sure, Card, present yourself to the esquires of the party. For my part, I shall address my inquiries to the quality. Yell and Arbogast. Oh. <laughs> uh, they'll look so crestfallen, lad. Your turn with the titles will come when your toes are more securely placed upon the higher rungs of constabulary promotion. I observe, Mr. Dossiter, that your master, Sir Jericho, seems devoted to the rigours of the chase. That observation is founded on hard facts, sir. The master has roamed in many of Hearth's wide quarters in search of trophies, from the eye savannas of colonial Guiana to the heckoing loneliness of the great Karoo. His guns has known little rest these past twelve years. Uh, but he still finds time for a useful day or two in the service of the House of Commons. Neglect of his constituents is not a charge as can be levelled against Sir Jericho, sir. Sleepless he is in his efforts to bring his peoples to the land of Pisgah. Nothing, sir. Show the inspector in at once. Busy men have need of punctuality. Obliged to you, Sir Jericho. Thank you, Dossita. Your humble, sir. Ever your humble hand, obedient. Inspector Millions, what an enchantment it is to meet a sleuth of your pronounced and often proven brilliance. Throw yourself into a chair, sir, if you please. Oh, <laughs> I acknowledge with gratitude that handsome tribute from so discerning a baronet as yourself, Sir Jericho. <laughs> well deserved, sir. Richly deserved. But how may I further your investigations? I spoke recently to the Laird of Yell. Uh, my assistant has spoken recently to the other members of that parliamentary party that visited the Crystal Palace. So far, all statements taken point to the fact that at no time where the members of the party separated from their guide and mentor. Would you corroborate this, Sir Jericho? Do you know I believe I would? Yes. Yes, we were at all times within earshot of our delightful and informative Cicerone. Of course you were. Of course you were. <laughs> Had you perchance any prior knowledge of the gardener, Muldoon? Would a gentleman have knowledge of an artisan? Yet I believe, sir, that you are not unacquainted with Xerxes, Lord Quandary, and his wife, Lady Melisand, uh, within whose purlieus the dead Muldoon once enjoyed many a happy and not unrewarded season of employment. <laughs> what a stern taskmaster it is, Inspector. Yes, I knew Muldoon was once employed by Quandary. But not once did I meet the fellow face to face. I perfectly understand, Sir Jericho. Why should you, a baronet and rover, have first-hand knowledge of a lowly son of toil? Sure, card. Inspector. 
I have spoken to the Laird of Yell and to the dashing Sir Jericho Arbogast. They maintain that the Parliamentary Party observing the Crystal Palace was all of a piece all the time. Yet Mr Cosmo Evergreen allowed that from time to time individual members of the party would stray as a fancy took them to an exhibit here or an area there. So... Here is an inconsistency. Innocent or intended? At present, I fail to see why any of these parliamentarians would wish to kill two artisans. And why are you looking so wan? We've had a note, sir, from Meldrum Cellar in Rotherhithe. A corpse was recovered from the Thames early this morning. Would you care to examine it? <coughs> <coughs> Why did you choose to summon me, Meldrum? The bodies fall in the Thames as thick as autumnal leaves, and they are none of my concern. But this one, sir, this one bears the marks of horror and unspeakable violence. Does it, though? <sighs> Remove the sheet, if you please, Meldrum. Bear with my warning, gents. This corpse is fair broke up, though the face has miraculously survived shattering. It's, it's Dimble's Earthrowl! A gent well known to you, Inspector? I put Earthrowl in jail as often as I put on my boots. And now he has made his last atonement. Ah, oh, this is a most horrible slaying, sir. His every bone looks broken. Oh, ugly, lad. Ugly work. <laughs> uh, but not, I think, within our bailiwick. Not relevant to the Crystal Palace death. Any papers? Any personal possessions on the corpse, Meldrum? Uh, well, well, uh, as to that, sir, sir. Meldrum, I warned you before about a pilfering from the dead. As to that, sir, sir I, uh, I found but one scrap of paper within a lining of the deceased's waistcoat, sir. Wet it was, all sodden, after some hours' immersion in the Queen of Rivers. Give it here. Hmm. Uh, it could be part of an envelope uh, and the name. Oh, confound it, this is a crab fist. Sure, God, turn your eyes to this. Uh, looks to be a Mrs. Glumdall Clitch Osborne uh, of Clapham Common, sir. Glumdall Clitch Osborne? What creature would own to a name like that? Hmm. Clapham Common this time of year is undeniably attractive, sure card. Man could do worse than buy a genteel property here against his ultimate retirement from the detective. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sirs. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mrs. Osborne? That pleasure is yours, sir. Mrs. Grumble, 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 Grumble a bitch, um, uh, Osborne. The same, sir. And who? Inspector Millions and uh, Mr. Shurkard of the detective, ma'am. The detective? Are you the bearers of ill news, Inspector? Uh, that we have yet to determine, ma'am. But might we conduct our colloquy within doors? Of course, pray forgive me. You seemed apprehensive, ma'am, when I announced our identities. Why would this be? Apprehensive? Well, yes, I am. Care to enlighten us, ma'am? My husband has been away for almost three days now, and, and still no word from him. Mr Osborne don't normally stray from hearth and home. My husband is not called Osborne, sirs. To my shame, I must confess it. But how may this be, ma'am? Our union has not been blessed by Mother Church, sirs. We are as one in common law, but not under the eye of heaven. Would your protector's name be Earthrowl, ma'am? Why do you start so? Earthrowl? But Mr Earthrowl is a recent partner of my protectors in a, in a small but energetic plasterer's business, sir. Plasterers? Earthrowl? Madam, I know two things about Nimble's Earthrowl. One, he was a thief. Two... He is now stone dead. And stone dead hath no fellow. But if, if Mr Earthrowl is stone dead, and, and, and my husband be not returned, can the same fate have overtaken him too? You say your husband has not been home for three days, ma'am. Incidentally, what is your uh, husband's name? Gimlinch, sir. Danvers Gimlinch, and as good a man as ever drew breath. Then why did he not make an honest woman of you? Because, sir, he... 
Already has a wife and daughter, though he has not set eyes on them for 20 years. And this man is now a plasterer? He and Mr. Earthrowl were employed upon some work in Marylebone, as I understand it. And his partner in plaster or felony, call it what you will, now lies dead in Meldrum Cellar at Rotherhithe. Dead terribly. Dead appallingly. Hmm? But dead, indubitably. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Osborne, uh, should your self-styled husband, Mr. Danvers Gimblinge, repair back to the comfort of his parlour, would you be so kind as to tell him to report straightway to Inspector Millions? His life, dear lady, may hang in the balance. If yet it hangs at all. Oh. Madam, we must leave you. From this ambiguous state, we must return to my office. Uh, be assured, we shall see you again. Oh, oh sirs, may, may, may I not offer you a glass of sherry wine? Uh, may father let me 86 bottles when he passed on, and some few are, are still left. Uh, regretfully, ma'am, we must hail a cab and be off. Uh, but uh, one last question. Uh, sir? Why the devil did your father call you glum, dull college? May father, the late Eutoxeter Osborne, was many things in his life. Drunkard... Glass blower, symbolist, naval architect, sonneteer, pederast, and Muslim scholar. But his greatest devotion was to that preeminent work of the ill starred genius Jonathan Swift. Eutoxeter Osborne, gentleman, was addicted to Gulliver's travels. Hence, Glumdul Clitch. Glumdul Clitch. And how, sir, is called Glub Dub Drib. My mind is bent on murder, lad. We are juggling with several plates at once. They must be identified <coughs> immediately before we lose control and they fall unremarked to earth. Very well, sir. Shall we examine the plates singly? <laughs> Item. Eight months ago, Temperance Muldoon quits the employment of Xerxes Lord Quandry in Suffolk. To seek his animal fortunes in London. Item. A week ago, an innocent named Victory Tid falls to his death in the Crystal Palace with prior injuries as yet unexplained. Item. Shortly afterwards, Temperance Muldoon is discovered dead in the branches of a sycamore tree in the Crystal Palace with mortal injuries as yet unexplained. Item. Muldoon lets out the upper rooms of his dwelling in Chelsea. Which are infrequently visited. Visited. Afternoons only, by a veiled lady of seemingly independent means. Item, Nimble's earth row, cut purse, oh, oh. pickpocket and bully boy goes into plasterer's business with an ex-sailor, Danvers Gimling. Item, earth row and Gimling disappear to undertake labour in Marylebone. Item, Xerxes Lord Quandry returns to London to his home in Bentick Street in the borough of Marleybone. Item, oh, Nimble's earth row is dragged out of the Thames, dreadfully done to death. Item, Danvers Gimling is accomplished, he's vanished. Item, Gimling, we must. Fine, Sir Curd. Gimblings we must by all means secure. Oh. Gimblings, here, yeah, man. Mr. John Schism. Who else? St. Paul's Cathedral. A pretty enough place to conduct our business, sir. The noble sentiments we hear may put an unction on that business, Gimlin. Yes, well, I have ill news, Mr. Joint Schism. You were unable to steal the correspondence from Lord Connery's home? We stole it, sir, yes. Uh, Earthrow came out of that upper window with the bundle in his hand. Uh, he passed it on to me before attempting to effect his descent by the drainpipe. But there was a commotion within the house. Voices raised. Candles are flickering and the sound of approaching footsteps. And in that instant, Nimble's Earthrow's natural skill deserts him. He misses his footing and falls some 60 feet to a desperate, shattered fate in the courtyard below. So he was found by Quandary's staff in the article of death? He was not. I went down the side of that house like a frantic ape, sir. Collected the mortal remains of Earthrow and was out of the rear door before the staff were fully aroused. And how did you dispose of the body? Into the Thames, sir, with only a gruff sailor's prayer to speed him on his last voyage. You did well, Gimlinch. Uh, there can be no unforeseen connections between us and the late Earth Earthrow, and the full fee for the robbery will be all yours. The fee, sir, is something we must discuss at length, be we in the house of the Lord or not. You would turn renegade? I did not realise when we undertook to burgle Lord Quandary's house the nature of the correspondence we should remove. It is compromising. Utterly. Well then, 
It compromises Lord Quandary, sir, and it also compromises a lady whose reputation I shall stop at nothing to protect. What's your pleasure, Inspector? Gin and water, if you please, Job, and a bowl of snuff. Sir? Well, then? Sir, interesting intelligence from Clapham Common. I should hope so, lad, and keep your voice down. You've loitered there long enough. Uh, well, I see, I shall have to buy you a drink. Ah, a glass of claret would do very well, sir, and I appreciate the thought. Claret? <laughs> well, you'll drink your beer and like it, boy. Uh, beer will be admirable, sir, most quenching. Gin, water, snuff, sir. Ah, and uh, beer for this young fellow. And beer for Mr. Surecard. Uh, snuff, Mr. Surecard. No, thank you, sir. Then tell me. <laughs> ah, what have you learned after... <laughs> Crapham Common. Miss Glumble Pritch Osborne as a child, sir. Huh? The daughter of some 17 summers. The devil she does. Name a daffodil, sir. An enchanting creature and one not slow to indulge in lively conversation with an officer of a detective incognito. But what did you learn? She collaborated a statement given by Miss Glumblecritch. Nor hide nor hair of Danvers Gimlinch has been seen since he went off three days ago on his plastering expedition to Marylebone with Nimble's Earth Ah. Oh. oh. Uh, here's your beer, lad. Ah, your health, sir. <laughs> well, it would seem. <laughs> a broad swing of coincidence if Gimblidge and Earthrow were in any way involved with Lord Quandary, but one that must, in default of anything better, be examined. Drink up your beer, lad, for I want you back at Clapham Common. Ready to apprehend for questioning this Danvers Gimlin. Should he return to, uh... Glub dub rib, sir. Uh, uh, should he... Uh, glub dub rib, yes. But loiter in the shadows, sure card. Do not attempt further intercourse with the doubtless winsome Daffodil Osborne. Hover in the dark, and should Gimlidge return, then pounce. May I ask, sir, where you will direct your steps? To Bentick Street. A word with Lord Quandary's butler may ease my mind. I, I fail to see your drift, Inspector. Nimble's earth realm was a cat burglar, sure can't. No plaster of he. So could it be that he and Gimblinch were suborned to burgle Lord Quandary's house? Could Earthrowl have met his desperate, shattered death whilst attempting to effect some felony at Seven Bentick Street? <laughs> Oh, uh, capital. Capital, Mr. Polly, capital. Uh, glad to see your high spirits have not been quelled by the recent depredations on this property. <laughs> depredations, Inspector? What depredations would they be? Oh, they the breaking of the premises. These premises, sir? Oh, sure it be. You jest, Inspector. Though my mean be jocund, my intentions are profoundly sober. I do assure you, Mr. Porritt. Was this house not burgled three nights ago? But, sir, had we been burgled, you may be sure we should have lost no time in raising the hue and cry. Of course you wouldn't. Uh, uh, might we take the air in the yard a moment, sir? I have something of a headache on me. Too much gin and insufficient water at the gallow glass arms. Eh? <laughs> Why, certainly, mm. Inspector. The yard is not large, but as you see, it gives on to the mews. <laughs> the air of Marley Bone at night is sweet and piercing, for it, even to these dull nostrils. Hello? What would this be, here, on the ground? Dried blood, Mr. Porritt, in some quantity. Uh, the, uh, the odd man slaughters the chickens here, sir. I, I regret he has not cleaned the uh, Augean stables as thoroughly as he should. <laughs> I hope you're not trifling with me, sir. Trifling, sir? Will you swear that this is the blood of poultry and not of a human being? <laughs> Inspector, your humour tends to the graveyard this evening, does it not? The instincts of my profession seldom desert me, Mr. Pollitt. Oh, would you tell me this? Is Sir Jericho Arbogast, sportsman and Member of Parliament, a frequent visitor here? Why, bless you, sir, as regular as clockwork. He and his lordship have been intimate these ten years or more. Oh. <laughs> Lord Quandry looks upon Sir Jericho 
as a son. <laughs> and does the Lady Melisande look upon him as a brother? But, Mr Shawcard, why will you not wait inside at Blood Dub Drib? I'm certain my father, when he returns, will be only too ready to apprise you of the facts that led to Mr Earthrow's death. Oh, Mr Gimlinch may be less ready than you think to talk to an officer, the detective, Mr Affordilla. Oh. I fear I must surprise him. Now, please, return to your home. Miss Osborne will be anxious on your... Oh, look! Is not that sagging figure that of my father? <laughs> Over there, coming through the wood. You know far better than I, Miss Daffodil. Is it he? I have the most dreadful misgivings. Why does he move so slowly, so warily? Drunk, perhaps? My father is no tosspot, sir. Oh, see, he has fallen. Then we must approach him at once. Oh, Papa, dearest Papa, whatever has happened to you? Daffodil... Flower of my heart. Oh, gaze your last upon your unfortunate father. Mr Gimlinch, I am a member of the detective. Oh. Who has done this fearful injury to you? A man named... A man named Joint Schism. Edgar Joint Schism. Oh, God, I die upon the hour. Please, this Joint Schism, was he a footpad? A gent. A gent. Tall he was, well spoken, dark hair, dark moustaches, and black of eyes. He smoked me, sir, under the fifth rib. And Earthrow? Did Joint Schism kill him too? Earthrow was. <laughs> I shall find his murderer, Miss Daffodil. I shall not rest till I have found this Edgar Joint Schism. And when I have found him, I shall see him swing for this foul mischief. You rang, my lord? Parrot, I understand that Inspector Millions was here last evening. He was, my lord. Then why was I not informed when her ladyship and I returned from the opera? He was quite satisfied, sir, that once his interview with me was over, he need not trouble your lordship. But what did he want? He was um, uh, investigating a possible burglary, my lady. Burglary? Well, here, my lady. Here? But I assured him that Seven Bentick Street has never been the scene of night marauding, my lady, and he went away agreeable and content having sampled a little of my rum and tobacco first. Parrot. Dear faithful fellow, well done. Well played indeed. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> pleasure was all mine, my lord. Oh. A caller? At this time of day? With your permission, my lord, I shall ascertain the identity of the caller. Uh, of course. Xerxes, in my dreams the other evening, I had visions of some burglary. That dreadful scream. And it was nothing but a nightmare, Melisande. <sighs> I thought I had reassured you on that score. Had there been a burglary, I should have summoned officers of the police at once. <laughs> Perhaps some unfortunate dweller on the street close by had been the victim of... The... Yes, Parrot. Sir Lucifer Hipkin has called, my lord. He's desirous of a few minutes' conversation with you. <sighs> Hipkin, that... Blackguard. What does he want of me? He said a few minutes' conversation would reveal the urgent nature of his call, my lord. Hmm. Merisand, will you excuse us? This must be some pressing parliamentary business, a division, perhaps. I shall go to the withdrawing room directly. But, Xerxes, pray do not distress yourself unnecessarily. Sir Lucifer is not worth any anxiety whatsoever. Hmm. How perceptive you are. And, my dearest, I shall be with you soon. <laughs> Very well, Parrot. Show Sir Lucifer in. Yes. Yes, you are called. It's a Mr. Porritt, sir, from Lord Quandry. Oh, what could this presage? Show the butler in, lad. Show him in. This way, sir. Mr. Porritt. Uh, good evening, sir. Stay, you are called. Sir. Your eyes are red, Mr. Porritt, and your cheeks hectic. Oh, sir. Lord Quandry has asked me to beg you to attend upon him immediately. Why could the noble lord not come here in person? That, sir, is unknown to me. I have a cab waiting, Inspector, for your convenience. That being so, I am prepared to accommodate his lordship. Sure card, your hat and mine. 
My ribs foretell a sudden end to many of our questionings. You were quick upon the summons, Inspector, and I thank you for it. I am eager to learn what you have to impart, Lord Quandary. Uh, this is my assistant, Mr. Shurkard. Your servant, sir. Mr. Shurkard, will you be seated, gentlemen? Uh, thank you, my lord. Sit, lad. Don't gape there. What I have to reveal, Inspector, is both tragic and terrible. <laughs> You have a cold, sir? Uh, a lively nose, my lord. Pray continue. My disclosure will shed light on much that has hitherto lain in the shadows of horror and suffering. But let me begin with Temperance Muldoon. Your erstwhile gardener? As you are already aware, Muldoon left my employment on the best of terms to seek work in London. Well then, some six months later, he came to see me here at Bentington Street... Alas, no pleasantries were to be exchanged, Inspector. Muldoon had turned blackmailer. But all the world knows that the House of Quandary is above suspicion. Oh, I thank you for that, sir, but unhappily it is not true. Muldoon, that fearful wretch, had discovered something regrettable in my past. He wanted money, gentlemen, in return for his silence. Enough, perhaps, to purchase a house in Chelsea? I paid him a pretty sum, Mr. Shawcard. Then he wanted more. Sir, uh, blackmail ever does. I realised he could and would go on and on with his insatiable demands until I was ruined. I became desperate. You did not think of confiding in the police? One breath of scandal and my look-for position as foreign secretary would forever be lost. So you thought to silence Muldoon yourself? Inspector, I am more than 60 years of age, a man with some infirmities. How could I compete in physical conflict with the brute strength of a man of the soil, a man almost 30 years by junior? Mm. So you hired the services of a desperado? Oh, just so. I did not want Muldoon murdered, Inspector. You must believe that. I merely wanted him terrified. Yes, I hired a desperado and told him what I required. I described Muldoon thoroughly. His appearance, his habit, his place of work. I paid the fellow a hundred guineas in advance. The fellow, hasty, anxious to have done with his odious work, did not pay sufficient attention to my instructions, to my horror. I read in the Times that two men had died. I can imagine your consternation. I hastened to London, intending to denounce the desperado, but he had forestalled me. When we arrived here, I found a sealed letter waiting for me. I was to meet him at 11 that night upon Westminster Bridge. One question, sirs, if I may. Sure, Colonel. It does have bearing, sir, on the matter in hand. Does it, lad? Um, my lord... What was the name of this assassin? Huh? Why, he gave his name as Earthrowl. What? Nimble's Earthrowl. Sure, God. My apologies. The name Earthrowl is known to you, gentlemen? It is indeed, my lord. <gasps> Intimately. But pray proceed to that sinister interview upon the bridge at 11 p.m. It was a foul and foggy night. A man could scarcely see his hand in front of his face. I reached the bridge and peered down, vainly hoping to descry some cheering ray of light from the brigs and colliers anchored below. But light there was none. Only the steady footfall of someone approaching me through that grim blanket of obscurity. It was Earthrowl, pale as snow but red of eye. I taxed him bitterly with the deaths of Muldoon and Tid. The wretch laughed and said that his services demanded compensation greater than I so far afforded. I threatened to denounce him. He made to attack me. But in the struggle, that demon lost his balance, overtoppled, and was gone down into the Thames, lost forever from the world of men. Hmm. Yet you did not see fit to report this incident. Inspector, I was too distracted to think of anything but to repair back to Bending Street and restore my wits. Have you had a visitor recently, Lord Quandary? I beg your pardon? A visitor to this house, to this room, recently. No, I have not, sir. Why do you ask? Do you smoke, my lord? Smoke, sir? 
I have hard the practice. No one spoke in any household of mine. So you have had no visitor here this evening? Damn me, sir, I have not. And of what relevance is that to my recent disclosure? Forgive me, my lord. You are aware, I imagine, that you will have to accompany me to the office, where a formal statement may be taken from you. I am aware of that. If you will give me two minutes, I shall collect the necessary statements myself. They are already set down and witnessed. Two minutes, my lord, are negligible. We shall attend you here. Thank you. Your card. Sir? Hover, lad. Hover in the hall. I want no midnight chases. Yes, sir. Sure card! Came from the study, sir. In there! Quick as you like! Too late, sir! <laughs> Too late! The master is dead! Self slaughter! Confirm, sure card! Sir! Uh, Porrit, a word in your ear. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Porrit, did you admit a visitor to his lordship shortly before you came to my office this evening? A visitor who smoked. Havana cigar? No, sir. No visitors at all today, apart from you two gentlemen of the detective. What a spectacle Hyde Park presents, sir. And the Crystal Palace in its pristine magnificence. Mm. The flower of the nation, of the empire, nay, dare I say it, the flower of the world. Assembled here for the opening of this most majestic of man's works. And thanks in no small part to you, sir. Tobacco, sure card. Cuban tobacco. Sir? Amid these festive imbecilities, lad, have you given a thought to the singular aroma of Cuban leaf tobacco? You have me on the hips, sir. I confess it. I smelt that aroma in Quandary's study the night of his confession. Yet he, aboard smoking, both he and Pollitt, denied the presence of any visitor that day. But the case is over, is it not? And you should be enjoying the delights of Hove, if not this present spectacle. But think, lad, why should Quandary confess when the only two men, Muldoon and Earthrow, who could assail his reputation, were both stone dead? Your conscience, sir. Lord Quandary admitted as much himself. And you were hoodwinked. But if the confession was in some way spurious, in which way now do your thoughts incline? There was no reason for Quandary's confession and suicide unless another foot stumbled upon his secrets. Another so high in rank or power that his removal could never go uninvestigated. Another who smoked Havana cigars and visited Lord Quandary some minutes before Porritt was dispatched to my office. Another who threatened Quandary with public obloquy unless he put an end to his wretched and conniving life. Yes, sir. I anxiously await. Consider, sure card, our earlier hypotheses, viz. that Earthrow and Gimlinch were effecting together a burglary of Quandary's house in Bentinck Street. Now, Earthrow, as we are told, fell off Westminster Bridge and hit the river with fatal, with bone-shattering impact. And his injuries could bear out that story. But Gimlinch was stabbed, as he averred with his latest breath, by one Edgar Joint Schism. Ah. A gent... Tall he was, well-spoken, dark hair, dark moustache and black eyes. I wonder, lad, if joint schism smokes Havana cigars. No hawkers, no harlots, no fishmongers. Inspector Millions and Dynasty Shurkard of the detective. The detective? Mr. Clatworthy. Your servant. Mr. Peebles Clatworthy. Your ineffable. Mr. Peebles Clatworthy, discriminating diarist and social historian. Your idiosyncratic. Who knows more about the Mother of Parliaments than Mr. Speaker himself? Your eternally gratified. It is of the lower house that we wish to inquire, sir. A kindly remove that arquebus from your shoulder and invite us to your study. 
Damn you, damn you, Clara. Cease your impertinence. Clara, sirs, is a lawless cat, hence her hatred of the detective. <laughs> you were asking? The defunct Lord Quandary, sir. I understand he had ambitions for the post of Foreign Secretary. True. Uh, what obstacles lay in his path? Who opposed him, you mean? But, sir, both chambers have been full of the gossip all year. Sir Lucifer Hipkin was chief contender for that position. Now, with poor old Xerxes done in, Sir Lucifer is first in line for the post you mentioned. Sir Lucifer Hipkin. Your manners, Clara. This Sir Lucifer, a tall and black-avised knight, would he be? Dark hair, dark moustaches? Hipkin to the echo, Mr. Safeguard. Obliged, sir. There was then within Parliament outright rancour between Lord Quandary and Sir Lucifer Hipkin. The venom crackled, sir, like a child's limbs in an open fire. And is this Hipkin to be found in London? A man incessantly vain of his physique, sirs. He occupies himself daily at Master Parmesan's fencing academy in Regent Street. The bold course is our only course, you are Sir Lucifer Hipkin! Is Sir Lucifer Hipkin present in this academy? Who oh, the juice is disturbing me? Sir Lucifer? The same? Allow me to introduce myself, sir. Cumberbatch is the name, Sir Lucifer. And this is my son, Young Dynasty. Devotees, both of your matchless steel. <laughs> Devil you are. As we stood and watched you confound your opponent, sir, with lunge in cart and tears, repost and recovery following one another in swift succession, we realised at once that we were in the presence of a master swordsman. <laughs> Did you, Joe? And I wish you'd say the like to Master Parmesan, sir. <laughs> <laughs> a cigar, sir? Allow me to present you with a cigar. Havana. It's uncommon civil of you, sir. My pleasure, sir, and my honour. And to congratulate you also on the quick dispatch of that scoundrel Gimblinch. Gimblinch? What's he to you? He perished, sir, with your name on his lips. Cut to death, he cried, and proud of it, by the rapier of Lucifer Hipkin. Oh, who in damnation are you, fellas? It is who you are that interests us, Sir Lucifer, for in certain parts of the city, you are better known as Edgar Joint Schism. Oh, oh, Sir Jericho, I bogast, my lady. Oh. Show him in, Porrit. Do, do, show Sir Jericho in. At once, your ladyship. Melly song. Jericho! Oh, my dear. My darling. Oh. Oh, what an extraordinary turn events have taken. Your husband dies confessing to the suborned murders of Tid and Muldoon and to the accidental slaying of Earthral, and today Sir Lucifer Hipkin admits to the murder of the man Gimlinch. Oh. What an almanac of horrors for London. But how fortunate for we two. Oh, my sweet. Oh, can our path to happiness lie across a meadow filled with corpses? They lie in the past, Melisande. Together we can surmount these horrors and be united at last. Oh, my dearest, on my knees I beg you to become my wife at last, no longer the admired consort of another. Oh, Jericho. You know too well how little I cared for Xerxes. How abominably he treated both myself and our son, little Gareth. Yet even at his most delinquent, Xerxes was possessed of some shreds of goodness. And I somehow believe that this terrible suicide of his was meant as an atonement for the unhappiness he had heaped upon me. He was a monster. Oh, not when I married him. He was bright and affectionate and... Generous. You are all too well aware of how vicious and depraved the man really was. I have lived with him for eight years as his wife. I have borne him a son. I have known amidst years of misery some moments of happiness. Melisande, do you love me? With all my heart. Then pray forswear your grief for that libertine and agree to become my wife, proudly proclaimed as such, and as soon as we decently may in the finest church this city boasts of. Stop that! 
tribulations shall come before I trust your tongue. Chin was indifferent last night, sir. Damn your impertinence, lad. Damn it, I say. Oh, forgive me for asking, sir, but ask I must. Well... Why are you here and not in Hove when your thoughts have inclined these past six months? Hove? The strange affair is over, sir. You, you've explained all. Sir Lucifer, wishing to oust Lord Quandry from his position as heir apparent to the post of Foreign Secretary, assumed the nom de guerre of Edgar Joint Schism. He paid Earthrowl and Gimlinch to burgle Quandary's home and find proof of some past misdemeanour. This was done, but Earthrowl was silenced by Lord Quandary and Gimlinch was mortally wounded by Sir Lucifer himself that no third party might discover the real facts. <laughs> then Sir Lucifer called on Lord Quandary, smoking a Havana cigar and confronted the trembling peer with written evidence of some scandal... Quandary promised to resign his political hopes in return for Sir Lucifer's silence and afterwards, recognising the terrible web of guilt he had himself helped to spin, sent for us. <sighs> Having admitted conniving at the murders of Tid and Muldoon at the Crystal Palace, he engaged himself in the possibly accidental death of Earthrowl. He wished to spare his wife, his family and the country further scandal and did away with himself. <laughs> and that is what the public is being asked to accept by the man upstairs. Asked to accept, sir? The existing scandal is such as to threaten the government already. Further revelations would lead to its complete overthrow. And so the man upstairs has directly instructed me to consider the case or cases irrevocably closed. Then you may depart for Hove at once. Will you stop harping on Hove? I thought of some other resort, perhaps. Bognor Regis, West Hartlepool. Sure, card. How, where, Tid and Muldoon killed physically. How? Does it matter, sir? Earthrowl was their executioner and Earthrowl is dead. Do you seriously believe that a man of Earthrowl's spectacularly low intellect could have conceived two murders so brilliant, so terrible and so inexplicable as to baffle forensic science? If so, the investigative career is not for you, lad. Now, come, let's be off. A new case, sir? The old case is officially closed, sure card. So we shall pay an entirely social visit to that colourful and gallant traveller, Sir Jericho Arbogast. Inspector Millions hand, Mr Shawcard, Sir Jericho. Milady. And how capital. Inspector, Mr. Shawcard, may I extend my congratulations to you both on a successful outcome to this tragic and complex affair. Oh, but forgive me, you have met, of course, Melisande, Lady Quandary? Indeed we have met, Jericho. Gentlemen, I am pleased that this occasion is something happier than the last occasion upon which we had conversation together. <laughs> happier, Milady? <laughs> oh, we must tell them. I shall tell them. I can no longer contain my greatest good fortune. Inspector, Mr. Um, Brazenose, Lady Quandary has agreed to cut short her normal period of mourning in order to make me the most divinely happy of mankind. <laughs> we are to be married, sirs, on Wednesday next at the Church of St. Matthew Carborundum in the city of Westminster. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> and I insist that you both be present, though whether as my guest... <laughs> Or Lady Quandary, as I have no mortal idea. <laughs> <laughs> then may we congratulate you on this moment of social harmony and decent joy. Oh, too kind, too kind, Mr. Hartcard. And I am sure you will give us the added pleasure of pledging that harmony and joy in a toast. Oh, <laughs> you were right, Sir Jericho. I did not it, sir. I did. Would you prepare a libation, a special libation for our guests and ourselves? On the instant, sir. Oh, uh, Nossiter. Sir? I believe, Nossiter, that you were brought up in Hove. You see before you a proud son of Hove, sir, to be sure. Uh, then may I <laughs> accompany you a moment, Nossiter? Hove interests me strangely. If uh, Lady Quandary and Sir Jericho will excuse me. Well, of course, Inspector. We are only too pleased that even the busiest, the most successful detective in the land has time to consider something so humane <laughs> as a holiday. <laughs> ah, Inspector, discussion finished. And knoss it up, the libation is correct in every particular. White rum, sir, hangers to all the bitters, crushed limes, some heritage water, and cracked ice. Ah. 
Ice? Ice in an English summer. This is indeed a miracle, Sir Jericho. But ice in a drink? Such a confection is called by our American cousins a cocktail inspector eh? because it is lively, full of metal, and it tickles the palate. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but how do you come by ice in this season, sir? Well, you need two elements, a good hard winter and a damp, cool cellar. I noted the idea when I was in India a few years ago. <laughs> you form the ice in winter in large blocks, wrap the blocks in burlap, put all in straw, and secrete deep in a cellar in moist, cool earth. I have a river close to the cellar here, and that keeps the temperature low all year. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another mystery solved, gentlemen, I hope, to your satisfaction. <laughs> now, uh, let us drink together, for I am anxious to taste this cocktail of yours at once, dear Jericho. <laughs> Who? Oh. Short card, sir, your assistant. We've a letter for you. Mark confidential from Scotland. Ah, oh, then give it here, lad. Sealed under the impress of the Earl of Lesmahago. Within this envelope, short card, my hopes are won or lost. <laughs> the news are good, sir. The news are fascinating, sure, card. <laughs> Cast your mind back to last week when you were alone and jovial with Sir Jericho and his bride to be. I was with Nossiter and begged to see Sir Jericho's trophies of the chase and his armoury. Amid all the weapons that adorned that great wall, one was conspicuous by its absence. My inquiries revealed that Sir Jericho had lent this unusual and long obsolescent weapon to the Earl of Les Mahago. I took the trouble to verify this. <laughs> and here is my answer. Well, sir. I cock a lore of sure card. Les Mahago denies all knowledge of this alleged loan. But if what possible interest can this be? Accompany me to the Crystal Palace late tonight, and I hope to show you, sure card. <laughs> Easy with that lantern, lad. We want no custodians disturbing us, or our necks are on the block. But why are we here, sir, in the sycamore room? This vast, vast edifice, that mighty tree, saw once the body of Temperance Muldoon, dead in that fork, some sixty foot above ground. Yes, sir. This was where the parliamentary party found him. To be sure. A party comprising... Uh, Mr Cosmo Evergreen, Mr Hatchard Millicent, Mr Nathaniel Upjohn and the Laird of Yell. And... Sir Jericho Arbogast. And what did Evergreen himself establish? That from time to time, members of the party separated. You begin to reassure me, lad. Look for the softest earth in this area and dig. Dig well, Sir Carl. Dig deep. Uh, this spot seems untrodden, sir. Protected as it is by the great base roots of the sycamore. Uh, yes. Yes, the earth is softer here. Sink your spade. Thus. <coughs> Have a care, lad. You may be striking evidence. <coughs> Yes, 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 yes. This is some strange agricultural implement. It's, it's buried here by error. It's... Great Scott. Great Scott, indeed, sure God. You have in your hand a crossbow. A crossbow belonging to Sir Jericho Arbogast? A crossbow supposedly lent to the Earl of Lesmahago three months ago or more. Yes, lad. What is it? The man upstairs is wondering how you intend to proceed with a new case, sir. The new case can wait. I am concerned with Victory Tid. Tid, sir? Why should Tid have to die, that most innocuous of mortals? A man who could surely have played no part in the obscene and sensational events that we are now enjoined to forget. I'm at a loss, sir. Always was where Tid was concerned. 
But may I draw your attention to the time? Why? It is now a quarter to three. If you recall, sir, we were invited to celebrate the nuptials of Sir Jericho Arbogast and Melisand Lady Quandary at the parish church of St. Matthew Carborundum in the city of Westminster 15 minutes ago. Why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony? Let him speak now or forever hold his peace. I am that man. I beg your pardon, sir. I am he who knows of that impediment. Have you taken leave of your senses, sir? My Lord Bishop, I am Inspector Millions of the Detective. Oh. And I am here to arrest the putative bridegroom, Sir Jerry Coe Arbogast, mm. on a charge of double homicide. <laughs> I shall see you ruined for this outrage, millions destroyed. You kill those men at the Crystal Palace, Sir Jerry Coe, and I can prove how you killed them. Why need not concern me as an officer of the law? But how could those unfortunate creatures have been murdered? There was no trace of a weapon. If you leave ice in a cocktail, Sir Jericho, for any length of time, what happens to it? Why, it melts, of course. And leaves no trace, as if it had never been. You mean, sir, that instead of a steel boat, he used a long, slim shard of ice as a projectile for his crossbow? A weapon of pure genius, sure card. For by the time the bodies were inspected, all trace of ice had vanished. But, Sir Jericho, I can hazard a guess as to why you slew Muldoon, but not Tid, a man you'd never met. You are indeed a great detective, sir, and I salute you. As to why I killed those men, the answer is simple. I had tired of killing beasts, both great and small, for the ultimate danger, the ultimate conquest, I had never attempted, the stalk and killing of a man. To do this in public, to court apprehension and trial and the gallows, and to evade them, this became my one ambition. And so I hit upon a weapon in the very means you suggested, and I used it once, from a distance and early, on a man who was later discovered to be victoriated. Flushed with that success, I could think of nothing but to dare again in even more perilous circumstances during the parliamentary visit to the palace. This time, the victim, then unknown to me since he was obscured by foliage, was Temperance Muldoon. Thereafter, I reburied the crossbow. I waited all. For a time, I thought I'd won. Your brilliance has discovered me, and now I am ready to embrace the fate I so inevitably deserve. We travel into Dunwich, sir. Surely Lady Quandry has suffered enough. Uh, tell me this, sure card. Why were Sir Jericho and Lady Quandary so anxious to marry so soon after the death of Lord Quandary, when they knew that by doing so they were brutally outraging all social conventions? Because they were very deeply in love, oh, sir. Oh, abandon these romanticisms, lad, and think again. I try, sir. I... I search and search about... Because a wife may not be obliged... To give evidence against her husband. I am sorry, Inspector, but Lady Quandary can see no one. She is prostrate, having taken at her physician's advice a strong sedative. You know me, Porrit. You know my rank and my authority. And I tell you that I must... Speak to Lady Quandary on the instant. It cannot be allowed, sir. You have ever been a loyal servant to the Lady Porrit. I respect you for it. But no good can come of obstructing me now. I must and will see the Lady Melisand at once. Very well, sir. Her ladyship is in the garden at the far end of it, overlooking the sea. Thank you. Sure card. Sir. Be so good as to wait for me here. I may be some time. L 
Lady Mary Sand? Inspector Millions, why are you here? I think you must know, ma'am. You have destroyed all I hold dear. Why do you seek me out now? Sir Jericho Arbogast killed two men in cold blood, my lady. I want you to tell me why. Lord Condory was an elderly man of an infirm constitution. You are a beautiful young woman. Sir Jericho is a handsome and adventurous young man. It was natural that youth should call to youth. There was love between us, certainly. But at no time did I ever transgress my marriage vows. Nevertheless, Temperance Muldoon became aware of this growing attachment between yourself and Sir Jericho. I think you paid Muldoon handsomely for his silence, enough for him to buy a house in Chelsea. But I think Muldoon wanted still more money, and from time to time you delivered it to him personally, veiled, always in a cab from Regent Street. Uh, and you argued and pleaded with him in an upper suite of four Trinkabilly stairs. Uh, I think that realising his demands would never cease, you told Sir Jericho of them. I think Sir Jericho, with cold and matchless cunning... No, no, With no. cold and matchless cunning, killed an unknown man, Victory Ted. Firstly, to try out his bizarre weapon for its effectiveness, and secondly, to draw me away from the killing of Muldoon with all its implications. Inspector... Believe this or not as you will. I wanted Jericho to buy Muldoon's perpetual silence with an offer of passage money to Australia and sufficient capital for him to start a farm there. It was not until I heard of the deaths of Muldoon and Tid from the Times newspaper that I realised that Jericho could have had no success with his bargaining and had stumbled upon the fact that it was no longer money that Muldoon wanted, but me. Wanted? You, milady? When I visited Muldoon for the last time in that oppressive house in Chelsea, he... I shudder even now to admit to such humiliation. He proposed that his dreadful room should be our place of assignation, that in return for my favours, he would not reveal to Lord Quandary the attachment that had grown between Sir Jericho and myself, an attachment which I repeat was blameless indeed if not entirely in emotion. This is an aspect of the affair that had never crossed my mind. Yet the most abominable thing of all was this. For 20 years, my husband had been conducting an affair with a woman and rejoiced to tell me of it. <sighs> a woman who was, he said, in every respect, my superior. Glumdall Clitz Osborne. Oh, dear God, you know that too. I could only guess till now. That person had a daughter... Daffodil by her self-styled protector, the man Danvers Gimblinge. Four years ago, my husband began debauching her too, oh. paying the mother handsomely for the privilege. Oh. Can you wonder, then, how sickened I was of Xerxes and how readily I found comfort in the presence of Sir Jericho? But Gimblinge knew nothing of this. <laughs> and he was suborned along with Earthrell to steal intimate correspondence between Miss Osborne and your husband. From Bentinck Street? Huh? Gimlinge, recognising that the letters hideously compromised his common-law wife and daughter, refused to deliver them. So, Sir Lucifer mortally wounded him and removed the correspondence. Oh, Inspector, what a nightmare tale of lust and greed and slaughter. Sir Lucifer Hipkin, bent on securing the Foreign Secretaryship, called on Lord Quandary and, lighting a Havana cigar, showed him the letters. Your husband realised that his reputation was ruined forever. And thinking for once of you, he invented a plausible story to cover the deaths of Tid, Muldoon and Earthrowl, then did away with himself. <sighs> Nothing more can happen to me now. But this is vital, my lady. Following the deaths of the two gardeners, did Sir Jericho ever disclose to you that it was he who had murdered them? Not once. He would never have inflicted that terrible knowledge upon me. But you guessed, Lady Melisand? I, I must have done. Oh, and having guessed, you were nevertheless prepared to join him in matrimony. A matrimony sanctioned by Holy Church. Should I have denounced the only man I ever loved? The man who, however brutally freed me of the loathsome embraces of Muldoon. My lady, 
The law of which I am an officer would maintain that you are an accessory after the fact of two murders. <laughs> Make no mistake. Sir Jericho is guilty, and he will be hanged. <laughs> Yet, the present horror at his false confession of motive would be greatly dissipated were the court to learn the true reason for his actions, that he wished to preserve your honour. To be imprisoned, to be separated from my son. Have I not suffered enough? Think, I urge you, of victory, Tid. A useful and holy innocent man in the prime of life. Does not his death cry out for retribution? My son, Gareth, is five years old, Inspector. When he grows old enough to understand, will you try to explain to him something of the complexity and cruelty of this life of mine? Because I see you are a just man. Terrible in your implacability, but... Just. I shall try, ma'am, with all my heart. Thank you. For some 400 years, the sea has been eating away at these cliffs of Dunwich. Far below us, somewhere on the ocean bed, lie great houses and churches and huge bells. Inch by inch, yard by yard, the headlands of Dunwich are claimed by the sea. Just so has my own short life been eaten, been entirely claimed by others' deceit and folly, and my own. I shall not see Dunwich again, Inspector. Uh, the wind mounts, the cliff is treacherous. Say goodbye to Jericho for me. Give him my unending love. Uh, do not approach too close to the edge, ma'am. Ma'am! Lady Millicent! Come back! Lady Millicent! What has happened, sir? Dear heaven, what's that noise? If we are creatures of any sensibility, Shuakar, we shall say it is the bells under the sea tolling for the soul of a confused, tormented, but valiant lady. In The Instruments of Darkness by Michael Robson, Inspector Millions was played by Nigel Stock, Dynasty Shore Card by Anthony Hall, Melisande by Elizabeth Proud, and Porrit by Richard Handel. Xerxes, Lord Quandre by Manning Wilson, Sir Jericho by Henry Knowles, Fleet Ned Sprott and Nossiter by Brian Hewlett, Dr Yolland and the Bishop by Michael Deacon. Caroline Muldoon, Heather Bell, Sir Lucifer Hipkin, Nigel Graham, Earth Rowell, Peter Wickham, Gimlinge, Michael Harbour, Meldrum and Peoples Clatworthy, Trader Faulkner, Daffodil, Penelope Reynolds, and Mrs. Glumdell Clitch Osborne, Irene Sutcliffe. The play was directed by David Spencer.